So this next session going on for the next 30 minutes is called Cap Cables. What are they and what do they do? Uh, we've heard from many people in, over the past few months, um, people just having questions, especially those in early stage uh, ventures, just trying to understand this, this, this whole world of, of funding and uh, venture funding, loans, equity financing, all these things. So um, had some conversations with, with these fine folks and we decided to, that this could be very useful for some people out there. Uh, Steven, who is, uh, we're chatting with right now, is the president and co-founder of Growth Lab, uh, a finance as a service company, and serves founders and management teams with financial planning, accounting, and CFO support. Steven is the driving force behind Growth Lab's CFO and strategic services. He specializes in helping startups, emerging growth companies, and companies in turnaround mode with things such as 409A valuations, bank restructuring advisory, capital raising, M&A transaction advisory, and much more. Growth Lab's cloud-based tools and recurring services are built to inform the management decision making. And soon joining him, six feet away, is Corey. Uh, he's the fp &A manager at Growth Lab. Specifically, Corey is a driving force behind the financial planning and analysis services. He specializes in helping startups, emerging growth companies, and companies in turnaround mode with things such as 13-week cash flows, annual operating plans, business modeling, cash flow forecasting, and much more. One thing I also um, would love to tell people is that they have a great little um, newsletter and blog. So if you're looking for just little snippets of some financial advice, it's a good place to go. And I'll turn it over to you two. Cool. Thanks, Avi. Appreciate it. Wanted to talk a bit about uh, cap tables. Um, they can be very interesting or very boring, depending on who you are and where you are with your business. Um, but you know what we wanted to hit on was you know what are they, how do they work, um, and this is pretty pretty uh, pretty basic slideshow here. What we're going to focus on is you know what is a cap table, why do you need one, and how do you use it for planning purposes. I'm just speaking to the speaker and realize I'm still on this on the uh, on the camera. So. I've got an example cap table that we can use as, as, our, uh, as a learning tool, and I'm happy for anybody to interrupt me with any questions if you have them, um, but let's just hit, hit with the basics. What is a cap table? A cap table is a um, schedule of who owns uh, how much of a company. Uh, it, the cap table is short for capitalization table, and yes, it just l lays out who owns how much of the company. When you're just getting started, it's just the founders, uh, founder or founders, um, but those, as many of us know, can be some of the more challenging conversations with co-founders, who owns how much. Um, and you, those can be boiled down into um, dollars and cents, or those can be boiled down into sweat equity, but those can be challenging conversations. In terms of what is on a cap table and what is not on a cap table, um, those that gets into uh, what makes up a cap table and a quote fully diluted cap table. Um, on your cap table is anybody that owns shares in your company, or if it's an LLC, it would be member units. Um, but let's stick with corporations, so let's stick with shares and options. Um, the only thing that is actually on your cap table officially is uh, those equity uh, ownership pieces. Um, options and convertible notes play into uh, a fully diluted cap table, but would not officially be on a snapshot picture in time of uh, your, your ownership of a, of a company. Um, so what is on it, what is not on it, you know, that, that kind of delineates the, between the two. Um, I'm going to jump to another slide before I come back here just to talk about the what um, and Corey, feel free to jump in if you feel like we need to describe something more. Um, but this is kind of a good example of a, of a cap table, and um, it is more than the cap table. And when any companies that we work with that we're um, helping them manage their business, you know, understanding their cap table, understanding the dynamics of the cap table is really important um, because it not only plays into who owns what today, but uh, you know, many conversations in the startup world are, you know, I'm going to raise a round um, 
uh, $500,000 convertible note round. And I'm hoping to that it converts into equity in 12 months when I raise $2 million. Well, what happens to your ownership as a founder when you are uh, raising $500,000 on a convertible note and you're raising another $2 million um, via a, a uh, qualified financing? What does your ownership percentage look like if you own 75% today? What's it going to look like after those two transactions? And those are not going to be your last ones if you're a scaling uh, startup. So that kind of gets, I'm getting ahead of myself into the planning process. But in this example of a cap table, um, we're looking at the cap table over time. Um, I think that's one thing that, you know, if you have a cap table already, this is not something that necessarily looks familiar, right? There's no one specific structure for how this should work. But I think what's important here, um, Steve, if you can help me with your cursor, but what's important here is how we break it out over time, right? That's going to see the real transition. It's going to tell the background and story of what happened through the course of the years uh, with your business. Um, so not all will look the same, right? Some may be just very simple. Some may have three lines on it. Um, but as it becomes more complex with different types of phantom equity, you can see outstanding convertibles. Um, that's where it gets into the scenario planning piece, like Steve was saying. So, Cool. We do, we do like to kind of present them like this. Um, and in, um, there's a lot of tools out there to manage a cap table. This one is straight up in Excel. Um, there's other tools out there. Carta is a fantastic tool. Um, there's, there's five or six others that are, that are, that are good as well. Um, but in any case, it's, I find it very uh, interesting and informative to look at the ownership over time. So like Corey was saying, this is essentially at founding, the cap table would have been this top uh, left uh, piece of the table. You know, as of the end of 2017, you know, it expanded. As of the end of 2018, it expanded, um, and this is just a, a an example of of, of, a, of a company. And then all of these things down here that Corey was mentioning, this phantom equity, um, this is uh, like options, outstanding convertible notes, and a Series B hy hypothetical. These are all kind of part of the scenario planning and, and what your cap table would look like um, after all of those things happened. Um, and to kind of just jump the gun, you know, this individual. Um, founder um, owned 69%, like as of like the current cap table, but after all of this stuff happens, after you grant some employees some options, you raise some additional capital and convertible notes, and then you do a series B financing at a um, free money of, uh, in this case, two, two and a half million, you know, you're, you're down to an ownership stake of about a, a quarter. Um, so these things very much have an impact on um, founders and how much they uh, um, own at the end of the day. Let me go back to that for a second. I think one other important derivative is this is like one piece of the conversation. Um, a second derivative of this that comes out of some of these conversations or some of these decision making points is the uh, the waterfall, right? Um, so I'm going to take a random example on here. One of the bottom lines, a Series B that may translate into 38,000 shares. 16 and a half percent, but that does not necessarily translate into if I sell a company for um, one million dollars, that's you know 16.5 percent of the proceeds, right? Uh, one of the waterfalls, the derivative of this is how that plays into preferences and other terms as a part of the agreement. So, um, this is an important piece of it, but it plays into many other decision making points surrounding it as well. So, so that kind of drives into the, the second kind of major category. We wanted to kind of hit on what a cap table is, why you should uh, have a cap table, why you need it, and uh, and planning. And obviously, we're kind of over, overlapping a, a, a few of these things, but um, hopefully, you know, you can see like why is it important that you uh, use your cap table as an active tool to um, understand where you are, especially in, in startup world. Um, it's easy. It would, be, it would be easy to ignore this. It would be easy to let your. Uh, we often see companies let their lawyers simply manage the cap table as a uh, reactionary after the fact tool. You know, what does my cap table look like after this round or after that round? Um, but really, being using it as a dashboard where you know you're driving down the highway and you know where you need to go, um, and your cap table is a is a tool because in the early days, your equity is your currency. And yes, hopefully you have a little money to pay some uh, outside providers, do some development, 
and pay some people some salaries. But um, part of any compensation package in a, in a startup uh, scenario is going to be um, some equity, some options, and you know that is your currency in the early days, and you really have to take that seriously. And if you're taking it seriously, you will um, make sure that you know what your offer for 10,000 options, just as an example, to a new employee vested over four years, what that's going to impact you and how that's going to impact your ability to raise capital and hire new employees, you know, six, 12 months down the road. I think one key thing that, you, Steve, you just mentioned um, that you find a lot of people talking about is I'm going to give you two and a half percent. I'm going to give you five percent, right? One of the key things in part of these cap tables is understanding what does that translate to in the number of shares, right? Because there can be a thousand things that pop up between when you promise something and when it actually gets executed. And so knowing and translating that it back into shares, number of shares, is super critical so that everyone's kind of in agreement. Everyone's, um, you know, there's nothing that can pop up. It's a great point. Um, and I've run into this with uh, customers multiple times um, where they've uh, specifically offered, hey, I'm going to give you 1% of the company or 5% of the company. Um, and that's great, um, but let's say that you offer that in June and your busy season is, uh, you know, Q3. You're not going to, and you forget about that. You put that in an offer letter. You sent that to your employee. Uh, that employee is expecting 5%, and it comes down to, you know, the next February after your busy season, after things are dying down. You're trying to catch up on paperwork. You, you try to paper that document with the employee. And 5% today, because you've already raised, you know, 500,000 in between on a convertible note. 5% Five, today looks like a lot different in number of shares than it did um, seven months ago, eight months ago. And the employee is still has 5% in his head. So it's super important as a founder and as a uh, manager to always talk in number of shares. So that's a long way of saying the same thing, just giving an example, because you can spend a lot of um, social capital with employees you can spend a lot of money with lawyers if you if you do, if you just if you talk in percentages and not in number of shares. Because uh, in in a cap table, you will you will hear the word fully diluted, and uh, that means if everybody that has options rights to execute uh, and grab a piece of the pump, piece of the pie, what happens to that cap table? If everybody does that, that that is a fully diluted cap table. In this example, um, right now, uh, this uh, cap table looks like this section section right here it has maybe ten line items on it, ten ten individuals or entities. A fully diluted cap table is this uh, is this one right here as of today. And if they do a Series B, you're going to look at uh, this column. So. It's the difference between, let's pick someone here, the 2018 money, it's the difference between having 6.6% 6 6, 6 .6 of the company and 2.7% of the company. Obviously, major difference. Um, and if you're only looking at your cap table as a static document, you're not really looking at the full picture. So that gets to kind of the why you should have a actively managed, you should actively manage your cap table, um, as well as, you know, um, what is planning? What does it mean to do a scenario plan with a cap table? Um, and you can really um, make this as simple or as complex as you want. As Corey was mentioning, you know, you can plan for your next round. You can plan for your employee options. You can even plan for an exit. What exit valuation do we think we can we can exit at? And if that if all that cash came in, who does it go to? Go to because you have you have options. You have uh, common stock. You have preferred stock. You have um, convertible notes. All these things play into, in different ways, um, what that cash waterfall would look like. We pause here. Does anyone have any questions before we kind of move on to diving into some more of that planning and, and scenario? You may be muted, by the way. Was going to jump in also if you have questions for the you can throw them in the chat or throw them directly to amy um
cool. Hearing hearing none, I'll just uh, play around with this for a little bit and see if people have any any questions. Um, this is the, kind of the example that we were uh, we were showing her, uh, just a static version of, um, and it's probably too small on your screen. Let me try and make it a little larger. Um, the uh, in the, in this in this scenario, this is our current cap table. Um, and the, we've, we've got some phantom equity out there. These are, this is an LLC. Um, so these would be um, options in a corporation, similar, similar type of uh, uh, um, uh, vehicle. Um, there are some con convertible notes outstanding. And if we raise a series B um, at a pre-money of 5 million and we raised, let's just, uh, let's just make this uh, 10 million. And we raised three million on a pre-money of ten million. Um, you know what does that do to um, each of these entities, each of these individuals? And um, often, it, you know, you're you're concerned with um, your key investors, yourself as a founder, and maybe one or two kind of key employees. Um, and what what does that do? And and so, you know, this is a great example of why why you need to talk numbers instead of percentages, because over time percentages change. You got uh, 6% down to 4.3%. And if we talked 6% to this individual and we gave it to them this time, we're going to give them a lot more shares than if we, uh, if we just give them a number of shares that we're going to grant them at any particular time. This, op this obviously looks very um, uh, in-depth. This is one of the more um, uh, complex cap tables to a, to a varying degree. So you may have a cap table that truly has you know three or four lines and that's okay um, it does not necessarily have to be broken out like this um, you know going back to for a second you know how is it built um, there are programs out there we use excel as steve's doing and that's we like to use excel for many different reasons but one of these being the scenario planning aspect of it but you know if you are just starting out if you are between you and a founder and maybe you're raising, you're raising some seed capital um, this is something that you can easily be doing by yourself. Um, you don't need to get your lawyer involved. Um, it, it can be very straightforward. Amy, you might need to tell me if there's questions coming in. I have no idea how to access questions. I'm or watching the chat, so I'm, okay. I'm good. So uh, maybe uh, let, me, let me ask the audience a question. Um, you know, what have you run into or what, uh, what learnings have you had as you've navigated the, 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 the realm of being a, um, a, a startup, uh, into either founder or a participant in an equity plan? Um, what have been issues that related to the cap table that you've, you've, uh, come across and you want to share like a tidbit with, uh, some, someone else from the audience. Unless someone, unless someone else has a burning question, I, I guess what um, I think could be useful is when people have, you know, this may be more for employees, but also small time investors, um, what is their role in knowing when things are gonna get more diluted? Yeah, so sometimes the answer is you, you don't tell them unless they ask. Um, tools like Carta, um, or other other tools out there that help you manage your you know SaaS tools that help you manage your cap table. Um, one of the reasons uh, you know that people are using them uh, as they kind of mature as a company is because you have more investors and they're asking for for more access. Um, and that's one way to give them kind of the always on ability to um, look at how much they own versus someone else. Um, and they can do their own scenario planning in terms of what does the cap table look like if we do X, Y, or Z? Um, in, ter in terms of uh, what you grant them visibility into, it's up to you as a, as a founder, and it's, 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 uh, depends on what their past investment has been, looked like and what their future investment could look like. Um, I would not waste too much time or energy with super small time investors, giving them scenario plans, but um, you know, I have worked with founders that are um, you know, that spend hours and good dollars um, doing different scenarios and giving them to potential investors uh, to give them a sense of 
you know, if, if X, Y, and Z happens, where am I going to be in, in 12 months as, as a part, as a part of ownership? So some investors do want to maintain a certain, certain level of ownership or else it's not worth it to them. Well, thank you. Hey, good afternoon. This is Dom Messerly. I have a comment to make, if I may. Sure. I thank you for the overview. It has been really good, very helpful for me. It's extremely uh, timely because right now I'm in the process of uh, fundraising uh, the next round and I'm thinking of convertible notes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started with the convertible notes, you know, I had to think about it. what's what's my valuation cap and what's my discount that I provide. And, you know, I just kind of pull it out of the air. So, well, I think maybe I have a discount of maybe 20% and uh, came up with a valuation cap where I thought this would be the value of my company when I go to series A, but I never knew kind of like, okay, how much of an impact does that have on my shares as well? And also didn't really know what does it give those particular note holders at the very end when we do an exit? Like many of these uh, investors always ask, you know, can I get it, you know, 10 multiple at the end of the day? So I had no idea and kind of put together a cap table like this and I started to play with, yeah, what is that discount rate on the convertible note? And mm -hmm. uh, what's my, you know, um, uh, valuation cap on there as well? And I could kind of play with it and, and just plug in the numbers. And I started to realize, you know, if I give, you know, 20%, you know, discount or a 15% discount, it doesn't matter this much or, you know, play with the valuation cap and I could see the impact. So for me, that part was super helpful to really right. determine what I'm comfortable with in regards to of, of, uh, what are the specific terms of convertible note. And this is my first time I've been doing it. so. Please, I'm happy to hear any advice if, you know, if, if this is kind of a reason for using a cap table as well, but uh, I thought it was helpful, but any comments and thoughts from your side would be great too. Yeah, and um, you, you said you did have that visibility into um, the, the scenario planning or you did not? I just used an Excel spreadsheet. That's what I did. You know, I yeah. just built up an Excel spreadsheet and put this together and uh, eventually I found it to be very helpful for that. Yeah, for, for sure. And you're, you're over at uh, Nemec, right? Uh, that's correct, yes. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Lenos Medical Medical Device Startup, and uh, I, I sit at Nemec, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, spinal uh, product, I believe. Is How right? do you know that? Yes. <laughs> I'm just trying to try stay connected. Um, yeah, no, the, the, the um, being able to answer those questions for yourself, like, uh, you know, what is it, how, how much, what, what, what levers make the biggest difference, right? Does the uh, discount rate, um, does that make a large difference or is it more about um, my valuation cap? Is it, is it about my pre-money valuation? It, it, all these different things are different levers that, that are impact. Like there's so many different things going into what this looks like after a, after, after a raise or after two, you know, two series of raises um, that, you know, it really behooves you as you, as you did, right. To, uh, you, I'm sure you've spent some good, good time and, and brain cells with that Excel spreadsheet to put it together. But it really, it gives you that like clarity of, of understanding, um, you know, what, what is going to make a difference and gives you better confidence to go out there and offer a 20% discount. Right. Um, Cause you're, you, you know, you're looking at that or you're looking at your, your valuation cap on the convertible note and wondering, you know, am I shooting myself in the foot here? And sometimes people just, fly blind and, and go by the seat of their pants and, uh, and other times, you know, it's, it's about, it's about planning and understanding, which gives you the confidence, right? Yeah, great. Absolutely. Thank you. I think that shows why it's so important to keep with it along the way, right? Because you may make a decision that sounds great, right? It's a great deal. Um, it fits what you are looking for, but it's so easy, uh, you know, across the years, especially if you do a convertible, you don't know when that will convert depending on your next round is um, for all of those decisions to kind of compound on top of each other and all hit at one point. Right. And so what may have been good individual decisions as a collective kind of um, don't fit as well together. If that makes sense. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Dom. Did we, did we answer the question or did we leave anything open for you? No, actually, this was really good because I, I felt a little bit like I was doing this a little bit blindly uh, on my own. But so it's kind of good to see from you guys that, uh, you know, kind of speaking about exactly doing the same thing. So it gives, gives me good confirmation that, yeah, this is the right thing to do. And uh, just, just knowing that you guys, you know, doing the same thing, same way is, uh, is helpful, is helpful for me for sure. So, yeah, thank you. Any other questions, thoughts, experiences? Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephen and Corey. It's, I think it's a, a, a fantastic introduction to, to all these things and uh, great to see um, some, some numbers in this world. <laughs> yeah, our pleasure. Get thank down, you, Avi. Get, get, down to, get down to the basics, you know, like we're back in a classroom. Um, Super informative. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. You know, one thing, slightly off topic, but it, it definitely relates to something I've been thinking about a lot the past few days is, you know, there's been talk out now for months that funding, especially venture funding, is going to start drying up and slowing down. And now more and more people are talking about it, especially this week, um, with, with, you know, this potential huge economic fallout. Um, was wondering, you know, what what you're seeing and the people you're talking to, and what you think is going to happen. Yeah, I think it'll be a quick and uh, uh, sudden downturn. I think we all are kind of at that point where we really um, are. I think hopefully we're all at that point where we're accepting that. Um, I also think it could be a quick recovery. Um, call it a V-shaped curve. Um, I hope the bottom is not uh, is pretty pointy and not very flat. Um, I do think that the companies that are able to, to survive and, and, and make it through, um, you know, the problem is we don't know how long that's going to be, um, but the companies that are going to survive and make it through are going to be able to turn the lights back on um, and get back to call it normal or new normal operations um, and, and be kind of back kind of run, run, run running with the show. I think what we're, what we're seeing with a lot of, our customers is um, obviously a lot of people have to shut their doors. And so when revenue goes to zero, it's um, a bit hard to manage your business as usual. Um, the questions that we're fielding and helping customers with, um, much of them revolve around um, employees. How do I, you know, what does it mean to furlough an employee? What does it mean to, you know, we all know what it means to lay off an employee, but what does it mean to furlough an employee? What are my options when I furlough an employee? How do I go about, you know, because all, the, all these business owners, and you all, you know, care about your employees, um, but, but also, you know, if you don't plan, you're not going to have a business um, in three months to employ anybody, let alone, let alone yourself. Um, and so, you know, the drum we're pounding with our customers and just send another email today um, is just giving them tools to be able to, to plan. Um, and, you know, first it comes down to um, a lot of people just go straight to cutting expenses. And yes, we all need to look at our expenses and our expense profile. What is kind of core to um, our uh, business? What's a foundation? Um, what do I need to maintain in order to be able to turn the lights back on in, let's just say, three months? Um, those things I want to I maintain. Other things I want to turn off. Um, but, you know, we've been saying... Go surgical with expenses initially. Don't go with a large breaststroke, so that you know you you are able to be able to turn things back on in in, in three week, three months. Um, and it's all about decision points, right? So that's that's kind of like the, the first first step. Um, you know, you're quickly going to get to um, you know three month cash flow planning, um, knowing knowing what the next three months look like. Um, and we don't we I don't have a crystal ball. But, um, you know, we all know our customers. We all know um, the, the uh, economic outlook that we're, that's out there. So we can predict and we can try and predict what our revenue and our cash is going to look like over the next three months, pretty close, pretty near term. With that tool in hand, um, you can make a lot more decisions. You want to be able to survive the, the downturn. You want to be able to turn the lights back on. And you probably want to look around and have the same people around you. 
that does not necessarily mean you have to keep paying people um, 100% when your doors are closed, uh, but it does mean you need to plan. It does need to mean, need, need to communicate. It does mean that you need to um, be empathetic with your team, with your customers, with your with your suppliers, um, and all these things are are uh, you know we we as a business started kind of thinking about this four or five weeks ago and communicating with our employees, with our customers. Um, so that when it came to the, you know, go time, uh, we're all in, in, you know, getting locked down. Um, it's not the first time that we're having these conversations. Um, but then, you know, once you get through, once you make a plan for the next three months, and it, it's a very fluid plan, I would say. Um, and sorry, Avi, I'm just kind of jumping into like some advice. And, you know, we, we've got tools that, um, you know, that we are providing to people to put those 13 week cash flows together so that you can make decisions. And you can look at, you know, which path do I take? You know, I'm going to make this decision today, but I, in two weeks, I know I'm going to need to make another decision based on what I'm seeing at that point in time. And right now, you know, your guess is as good as mine in terms of what that's going to look like. Um, but um, yeah, once you get through there, then you have to look, relook at your long range planning. What, where do I want to be in three years? Um, and what impact does this have on, um, on that plan? And specifically for today, I mean, everybody's talking about the um, the economic stimulus bill that's uh, the CARES Act that's uh, actively being discussed, I'm sure, in D.C. right now. A um, lot of good stuff in there. Um, but if, you know, if, if your business was not really surviving before all of this, do you really want to take on extra debt and um, just to, you know, die another day? Or, you know, if, if your business is is uh, is is growing, you know, it's a good opportunity to take advantage of some of those things. Um, I'm just recommending to all of our customers, like, let's make sure we're not just uh, jumping on um, free money. Let's make sure it fits within our plan because we're going to um, need to pay, pay these things back. Somebody has to pay the piper. We've put out a lot of content lately uh, that kind of goes into more specifics that Steve was talking about too on our, on our, on our social pages, open to everyone. So check that out. And I think I'll be one more point on, your specific question around like fundraising, what I've been seeing with some of our customers is it really depends if they have those relationships with the, with the VCs or the funders um, already established, right? Um, I've seen a couple of our customers start shaking those trees that they've already had relationships with and that's become fruitful, right? I don't think that if you are starting a new relationship, I think that will be very difficult right now. But if you do have those relationships um, actively, um, otherwise, you know, those investors are sitting on that capital and not really deploying it, right? So they want, they need to deploy it. Um, so I think it's important to kind of shake those trees that you already have. I actually really appreciate um, Stephen and Corey, how we transitioned this conversation, made it more broad for also these small businesses who are, are dealing with this kind of very immediate um, financial conundrum that they're, you know, even as an organization like ourselves with the district hall being closed, we're having these discussions um, about what, what the future is and, and, when we're going to be able to open back up. Again. Exactly. Yeah.